All right, everybody, welcome back to After Hours. We're going to have an amazing show today. So, team, make sure you stick around until the end. We have topics like Casper, like XRP. And specifically, we're going to start the show off talking about Casper.shopping, earning Casper on shopping rewards. It's very interesting. I'm going to give you the whole breakdown. We're also going to talk about Spot Ethereum ETF. We're going to have a little discussion on that in relation to staking services. We're also going to talk about Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse. He made some comments this weekend at Consensus and some interesting comments, and he was very um at ease when discussing and he's talked a uh, cover a wide range of topics talking about stablecoin talking about you know the crypto topics in uh, the election right now or the we got the candidates talking about right. bitcoin and crypto and uh other things relating to ripple sec v ripple we're gonna get all into that team here on after hours maddie before we get into these topics though Bitcoin this weekend poked back above $70,000 and we saw a spike in Bitcoin dominance. And I was telling you before the show, I want to provide value today. And in value, I need you to give a breakdown a little bit about Bitcoin. But Maddie, I want you to like give people perspective here. Um, market sentiment, what is it right now? How are people feeling? Also, some members, I was telling you, I was asking you, I was like, I wonder how many members are still behind. I hope they're not. I hope they're paying attention. But I know for sure a lot of you that aren't crypto charge members are way behind. You're so lost right now. Like you're probably just buying Bitcoin and you don't have a game plan. You don't have alert set up. You don't know where you're selling. You have no idea what you're doing. Uh, so <laughs> a lot of people just have not been taking their crypto education, their buying, their game planning seriously. And I wanted to ask you, Maddie, do people that want to be heavily exposed to crypto still have time? Yeah, I definitely think that there's still plenty of time to get involved in this market. You know, that, I am going to say that less and less as the cycle goes on, there is going to be less and less opportunity. And you do have to be a lot more picky about those opportunities that you jump on as we get later into the cycle, as there becomes a less asymmetrical uh, risk to reward available for a lot of these assets. So all coin market, very, very juicy right now. We have, you know, most of this consolidation we've had over the last, uh, let's call it 80 days or so, has been very, very healthy. And I know it's boring for a lot of people and they're frustrated and to them, they think that's a topping signal and that, you know, crypto is dead, but you guys are just very impatient a lot of the time. Um, it's very normal, it's very healthy. We are seeing some interesting mixed signals across the board though. A lot of times what we'll see is we'll see the equity markets like the stock market uh, and then crypto run side by side as they're both risk on assets. But we're seeing a little bit of a disconnect right now. So we've seen the Dow Jones take some pretty big steps back. We've had a, a big drop below some of these short-term MAs being the 50-day and 100-day moving averages. So seeing a little bit of weakness in the equity markets. Now, S&P and NASDAQ holding up a little bit better than that, kind of establishing a higher low, whereas the Dow Jones kind of just dove back down to the bottom of the range. However, when we look at crypto, and we've talked you know extensively on the show about some of the structures that have been developed on the daily charts and on the 12-hour charts with Bitcoin, we've got the inverse head and shoulder structure maintaining it above the pivot zone there. A lot of altcoins defending some very big important breakout back test zones you guys you know if you're with us actually on our program on our cryptocharge.com platform you guys know that burned into your brain you guys know the exact structure i'm talking about i've seen it uh, across the board a lot of resiliency we're seeing alluvium buyer step in api3 buyer step in we're seeing a lot of good signs in the altcoin market and uh, i guess the final piece that i would you know always consider is the dollar we're seeing some weakness in dixie dollar index uh, and that's generally a good inverse correlation that we want to see continue when you have a weakness in the dollar and then you see that strength pick up and risk on assets just you know again generally blended across the board that's generally a very good sign so obviously you know want to see that next leg up towards 84 85k for bitcoin that's going to really allow alts to start breathing as well um, but i think structurally everything looks quite good maddie that is awesome and i'm very excited for the upcoming weeks the upcoming months and i'm very excited to get into the topics here but before we dive deep into casper xrp all that good stuff team become a crypto charge member i sound like a broken record we have a lot of things we actually made some updates this past weekend maddie did a crypto wallet overview a little breakdown of that for the members he also updated the technicals so you guys have uh insight into that and so team become a crypto charge member click the link the pin link down below where you have the daily shows the tools uh, you have access to our Discord, so when you get on the platform, use code YouTube, you get access. And on the side panel, you can click Community tab, and that will take you to our Discord. Get access to the team there, the rest of the community of smart individuals that are currently in crypto. 
and uh, you, you should just do that now. Do that now while you're watching this video. Um, but also with that too, I feel like um, I feel like, which is like not always an indication of the truth, but I personally feel like the team is on track here. And I was talking to Maddie before the show. Hey, how far is the team ahead? And you know, he said. Uh, the, the the team that's been with us a year, two years, they're on point, you know, and the team that's been, you know, with us, you know, the team members that have been with us last six months, maybe a little bit farther behind. So you guys listening right now, you guys need to get ahead. If you're in the crypto charge community right now and you're watching this, you definitely should be on point here. You should have done uh, everything. I mean, we did the work. We built the plan, we fine-tuned the plan, Maddie, and then we brought it to the crypto charge community. Here's the plan, this is what we're doing, and all you have to do is execute. All you had to do was, you know, buy crypto, you know, game plan, selling, alerts, all that good stuff. And in the future, I said last week on the Ask Maddie Show, we will talk about uh, some tips, uh, not in full depth, but some tips when exiting. And we're probably going to do that next week. I said we'd probably do it this week, but next week. There's just a lot of topics we need to discuss right now. So make sure you subscribe to see that next week. But let's get into the topics here, Matt, because we have some good things to talk about here in relation to Casper shopping. And think back to 2022 for me, Matt. And one of the things, so like, 2022, 2021, 2022 was like the years when I start investing seriously, not just right. like I bought my first crypto, uh, Bitcoin and Tezos in like 2017, 2018. But that was just like, you know, I was a, a child at that point, just buying crypto. <laughs> but I seriously started buying crypto 2021 a little bit seriously in 2022, which is when the bear market started and when I seriously was taking money, you know, significant amount of money and putting into crypto every single uh, time I got paid. And so with that, though, I have been like kind of like the rabbit or like the test chipmunk, you know, like if you're a crypto charge member and you've like, you know, you've been around like I am that person, like I have done what we, what Maddie here, what you brought, like XRP, Casper, Zcash, all these things, like I am the poster child of that. You know, what What you think uh, a person that invested in the bear market is reaping the rewards, I'm that person. I'm reaping the rewards. Like down a little bit, started early with uh, XRP and Casper, and a lot of that money was deployed. But towards the end of it, I started really getting into the API 3, the Zcash, the HBAR, and those ones are up tremendously, you know. So um, I'm the poster child for that. But what I wanted to get to in that time period of 2021 and 2022, Matt, is when you provide the value for the team. And the value for me was that Coinbase card, okay? When we're able to talk about crypto in the real world, that's where it hits for people. You know, right. and so that Coinbase card hit for me. And you know, when we got it, we were on the wait list, and then we got it, and it was awesome. I remember, uh, you know, going to wherever I was going, like shopping, Walmart, whatever, and swiping, getting four percent back in XLM. Now today, it is zero point five percent back on XLM, along with like Bitcoin, Ethereum and Matic, so not as lucrative, um, and I'm still looking for other options there. And if you have any other options, Maddie, I'd love to hear them. What are you, are you still using your Coinbase card or no? Yeah, so when they drop those rewards down significantly, just my regular Capital One cashback reward yeah. cards are just paying me more. So it just didn't make sense for me to do that, right? Because I could take those same cashback rewards and you know put them back into crypto. Um, you know, I I do like uh, the idea of us earning back in crypto. For some people, it's not going to be as practical. Um, some people would rather just have that USDC reward back. Um, but you know, I, I think that is kind of uh, exciting too when you do get some of those rewards and you, maybe you don't pay attention for a while and then they stack up. Um, you know, and then the market has a nice upturn and those rewards are worth. You Know, significantly more um, than just taking cash. But right now, um, it's a it's a pretty small amount that they're offering on the Coinbase card. But uh, now we have this uh, Casper shopping. Um, and it reminds me kind of a bit of uh, the Honey extension, which I'm a very big fan of. Um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you guys remember the, the days of having to go through multiple threads of people posting, you know, kind of just third party of, of codes that they say work and you have to keep going back and forth and popping them in. And now we have, you know, software that allows us to kind of just like rip through all the codes, try them out. And then now, even if you don't, you know, if there's not a code available, um, sometimes there's cash back through PayPal or you can even just put a request in with the vendor and be like, hey, a lot of people who, you know, use the Honey extension would love to get a little bit of cash back on their purchase. And sometimes you do get a little bit of money back, I mean, maybe a few hundred bucks. I think I've gotten over the years from Honey Cash back with PayPal. So um, if we are able to, uh, you know, with some of these vendors, uh, earn a little bit of cash back, if you're already going to spend the money there, I know for sure I spend money at Ace Hardware uh, several times a year um, with different home projects and whatnot. Earning some money back in, in Casper would be very exciting. And, you know, especially if we're able to take that, you know, on a regular basis, stack that back into the staking protocol, let that cook up, 
that's a really big, you know, cascade of, of stacking rewards there. So I think it's exciting. And I think we're going to continue to see more of this um, throughout different protocols as kind of like an incentive to get people more familiar with the platform, more familiar with their project, um, you know, and the more visibility you have, uh, the bigger the community build. And of course, that just kind of project uh, propels us, you know, forward in a, in a much faster way. Absolutely, Maddie. And this, the thing that sucks about this is I have to be honest with you, team, and I don't like bringing things. And I don't think we should ever like as like people on YouTube or maybe it's like influencers you watch or people you respect in crypto, they might bring you something and then it's not valuable to you. Okay. And I would never, I would never want to be that person that's like, you know, right. oh, Ripple's offering this and this could help with, with this. But, but you can't use it unless you're an accredited <laughs> investor. You know, it's like, what's right. the point of that? And so... I wanted to bring this Casper uh, dot shopping. So this is not on the same par as like a Coinbase card. Unfortunately, this isn't a Casper card, but this is Casper shopping. And I know a lot of you are doing shopping online. And so this could help you a lot. So I went through it and here's some some things you want to know here. So I connected my ledger right here. And when you go to Casper dot live, they have the products up top and you just click on Casper dot shopping or you can go to Casper dot shopping and you have some options right here. Right. Matty, you just mentioned Ace Hardware. So connect your ledger and then click on where you'd like to earn cash back. And so in the discord this morning, I this NordVPN got pulled up. And so I dropped like. I use ExpressVPN. I just dropped in the Discord like, hey, does anyone, you know, use ExpressVPN and NordVPN? Like, did, could someone tell me the difference here? And so I might consider this. And so what you want to do is click on it, click activate, but read this cashback terms and in, in exclusions because this will get you the breakdown of what you are getting. And then you'll realize it's like for one, one purchase per customer. So it's not that lucrative. But I wanted to talk about like some other things in here. So let's talk about Expedia next. So in Expedia, you click on it, click activate, and here's some options here. So you got car bookings for 1.2%, and then you have cruise bookings for 3.6%. And Maddie, I know we talked, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, and I brought up cruises to you, and you, you kind of, <laughs> you remember that conversation? I hate cruises. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you gave that like, uh, back, and I was like, wait, 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 Maddie, uh, you're, I hear you. I hear you. And that's actually a reaction a lot of people have to cruises. And I completely understand. A lot of people, when they think about cruises, they think about carnival cruises, like shoulder to shoulder, uh, on the deck, very uncomfortable. The Guy Fieri burgers are awesome, but like the shoulder to shoulderness, the super packed boat is not for everyone. And I was telling Maddie, like, hey, Celebrity Cruise Line, bro. Take a Celebrity Cruise in the Mediterranean or in the Caribbean. Like, it will be awesome. You'll love it so much. And it's really empty and you can... You know, have your kids run to the buffet and get fat or whatever <laughs> and, and eat food and, and indulge. But what, what I wanted to do, so here's like, you know, here's some I could pre, uh, foresee myself using. So if we're talking about 3.6% uh, back in Casper, we're talking, looking at like Expedia here. The Celebrity Cruise is on there. So not talking about, you know, this image you have in your head of like this crazy packed boat when talking about Carnival. But Celebrity Cruise, you have that as well. I know they have some other options right here, Disney. And, you know, there's some smaller boats um, that you can go on a little bit more private as well. So, I mean, if you're spending 1200 bucks on a nine-day trip in Europe and you're getting 3.6% back in Casper, I would say it's worth it. And, you know, you get to use... Your credit card and you get you get it back in Casper. So I think that is something I could foresee myself using. And as well as I know I was talking to someone this weekend about Instacart and you know, one time purchase, you make the first time purchase at Instacart, you go pick up your groceries, you can get six percent back in Casper, and then everything after that is one point two percent. So if it works for you, great. I just wanted to throw this out there. Maddie, could you see yourself using something like this? Yeah, I actually exclusively use Expedia for all of my booking, when, especially when it comes to hotels. I want to yep. say like probably because I do a lot of festivals, I probably spend on average like four to five K a year in, in hotels. Um, and uh, you get one key cash back. This is literally not a commercial for Expedia. I'm not <laughs> yeah. compensated by them. I'm just, I, I do like that we're able to stack here. So wait, if you guys use Expedia, you get one key cash. So it's, you can use it across a lot of different platforms, um, including Verbo, which is basically like Airbnb. So you can apply your rewards back to that as well. So if you're able to earn Casper, and then also stack your one key cash. Um, and then you can also be put in different tiers if you spend enough money Expedia. You could actually be getting something that's like pretty decently lucrative. So, you know, I, who, who doesn't like free free crypto though, right? Like, it, especially if you're already going to do these things, you're not going out of your way to spend the money on it and you're already going to spend the money, might as well take it, right? Easy money. So I could foresee myself using a couple of these. So the NordVPN, uh, you get the account for two years, 
plan and it's pretty cheap. And then the Expedia, maybe even the Instacart, I just you know got turned on to it this weekend about it. And so that's where I could see myself using something like this. So if I see myself using this, which I'm very bare bones, like Maddie had to like convince me. It took months for him to convince me to get an Express VPN just because like I don't <laughs> I hate if I can limit the monthly charges, the recurring monthly charges, right. I will, you know. Um, but I could do this and then earn crypto back. So I think it's worthwhile. So if I'm going to be doing it, I can foresee myself hearing you guys in the comments being like, oh, this is money. Like I'm earning Casper now. Just want to shout that out. Let's move on to Hong Kong SFC considers allowing Ether stakings for ETF users. So high demand uh, spot, you know, Bitcoin ETF, spot Ethereum ETF likely see high demand in that in America, but in Hong Kong, not much demand. And likely since that, um, Hong Kong SFCs had discussion with ETF issuers about staking services via licensed platforms. And I just wanted to point out three weeks ago, we heard Grayscale had removed the mention of stakings from public filings, you know, signaling that the SEC may allow these products to trade in the U.S. without staking. So staking's out of there. Matty, question for you here. How is Hong Kong going further down the rabbit hole here? And also, could you, in the near term, see staking services offered to retail via licensed platforms offered in America? So Hong Kong actually shot themselves in the foot during the last bull. Um, they they restricted uh, crypto trading for retail investors. Um, and then, you know, after the, the market started to kind of recover again, then they decided, hey, we're actually going to open it up. Actually, I want to say it was summer of last year. So I think it was about a year ago uh, now, maybe sh just shy of a year. But I think it was about last summer that we we opened uh, trading in Hong Kong. So um, they kind of let some of that demand die out. Uh, you could have had people accumulating and, and collecting taxes and, you know, making a lot of money by letting retail engage. And they decided to, you know, hold off on that. Now, the staking kind of brings a different element to it. And I understand that, you know, there's a lot of government agencies that are trying to, you know, put the put the triangle in the, you know, the circular hole and it, it doesn't work because these assets are very different than just um, lending your, your assets out. Now, with certain protocols like Ethereum, it's a proof of stake model, right? And if you guys are not familiar, you guys are brand new. Ethereum used to be a proof of work model. So people, you know, the you're using GPUs for mining. That's why we have the GPU market has come down significantly, not just because of the microchip crisis, but also because of the um, the the lack of, of mining that's happening now with using GPUs. There's like literally just maybe two or three main coins now that are actually using GPU mining. Um, we've moved to the proof of stake model. So that means that the consensus itself uh, bakes in staking. So you're not lending your coins, you are staking your coins with uh, with validators and that helps contribute to the security of the network and that's different than me taking something that's not a proof of stake model for example taking my bitcoin and lending my bitcoin to somebody and now there's kind of like this strange contract that occurs that's different than the proof of stake model so we have a lot of details to iron out whether we're talking about hong kong or here in the u.s when it comes to staking because we don't want to give everyone just the broad idea that you know anyone can can offer you a ridiculous apy without giving you some sort of like contractual agreement right like truth and lending laws most likely need to be, you know, um, implied and conveyed to customers, even if we're in a DeFi uh, capacity, right? Like even we're using smart contracts, we need to make sure that we're issuing the same kinds of financial statements that we would if I were to be lending out my stocks. Um, but there is kind of that gray zone with the proof of stake model. And that is something that Congress needs to provide clarity on so that we can move forward with that. Once Congress has done a better job and once we have a president that doesn't veto pro crypto, uh, you know, uh, legislation, then we're going to get a lot further in the staking game. But for now, just kind of like waddling around, letting the SEC just kind of crush things and not letting people earn a whole, a whole lot of money. Ripple CEO mentioned that the crypto industry in the U.S. dealing with hostile regulatory environment. So at Consensus this weekend, Brad G. sat down with this other lady to t discuss crypto and a bunch of different topics. And we're going to go, we're going to start broad with how he started. They started broad topics and we're going to narrow it down. I'm kind of going to list off a lot of the things he said. I know Matt's going to jump in with commentary. I'll have my own commentary and we'll just kind of get through all of this because I think this is a good accumulation of things we've talked about in previous shows. When we're talking about stablecoin, we're talking about SEC v. Ripple, when we're talking about even as early as last week when discussing, you know, presidential candidates discussing crypto. So let's start there. He mentioned, Brad Garlinghouse, Ripple CEO, mentioned in this interview, crypto becoming a presidential topic this election. And I we definitely see this, all right? So early we saw RFK Jr., you know, backing uh, Bitcoin specifically and being anti-CBDC. And we've sure. seen Biden with the laser eyes on social, which amounts to nothing. And as last week we've seen 
Donald Trump discussing uh, Bitcoin and crypto and then, you know, kind of speaking to us, Matt, like Elizabeth Warren, no CBDC, you know, so that has been a topic of conversation. Brad Garlinghouse also mentioned some of our financial system was developed 50 and 60 years ago, and it is time to bring it into the Internet age for the benefit of consumers and businesses, Maddie. So what I got from him saying this was not a replacement, but integration, which is something I've heard you talk a lot about. Can you expand on that thought? Yeah, I I, def I definitely don't believe that we just move into like this crypto only you know, protocol. That, now, that's not to say that like, you know, we don't use stable coins as our, our primary medium of value and those stable coins represent, you know, M1 money supply or, or whatever we want it to represent. Um, but it's it takes time to integrate this kind of technology into a legacy system that is still very very slow and far behind right like you have all of these systems that have been around let's say even like 15 or 20 years um and a lot of them you know a lot of this technology there's a lot of vendors that choose not to to use this technology even though it's the preferred method it's the way that everyone else does business it's the way that everyone else banks um you're also just not going to have this huge rush of everyone who's used to using these financial institutions you know uh, blaze into a self-custody solution there will always be the minority that opts in for a self-custody solution, but the majority of people need to have a customer support person, right? They need to be able to reverse the transaction because they're too stupid to figure it out. You're going to have to figure out what those reserves look like for banks when it comes to crypto. Um, and like we talked about with staking, with lending, there's a lot of moving pieces uh, when we look at the existing financial system that are not just going to be overhauled overnight. You also have to consider a lot of the players that are in the legacy space right now. They're not going to relinquish all of this control. They're not going to just adopt all of your new systems, even if your tech is that much better because they profit off of the dysfunction. They profit off of the friction in the system. So you, again, need this, this segue of congressional you know, definition of what these assets are, who's allowed to custody them, how they have to custody them. And then we can start to see that integration happen. But again, the other piece of that that I just mentioned is that you have this older generation as well that doesn't even engage in online banking. There is a double digit percentage of older people in the United States that do not use online banking. They go into the bank to do all of their business. Um, and it's really stupid, right? Because like it's not very difficult to use. And these are the same people who will, you know, uh, sign up on Facebook, even though again they don't maybe know how to use it all the way, but they'll you know they'll use the internet, they'll they'll use the tools they want to use. They're just afraid to do their finances online. So you're going to have that generation that some of them will figure it out, some of them will probably pass before they figure it out. Um, but you have to make it easy enough for people who have you know significant amount of money in the bank to manage this and not be worried about you know long long addresses, irreversible transactions, right? Like we need to have some sort of safeguards in place when it comes to institutional transfers. Now I don't think that has to affect us on a protocol level when we're doing you know self-custody self-custody um, but having some sort of middleman having some sort of insurance for the average, average average everyday man when it comes to the legacy banking system is going to be a very important piece absolutely maddie and you just brought up like the older generation and i wasn't going to bring it up on this show but like during my like scan through the internet i listened to david kraus he's an associate professor and he is on the board of, what was it, WRS, which is Wisconsin Retirement Services. And they're buying Bitcoin right now. So they're buying about $180 million worth of Bitcoin, which is like um, a tenth of 1% of you know what they have to invest. But they are stepping their toes into crypto. And I thought it was interesting because that is a way where I can see someone like, you know, I know many of you probably have grandparents that are retired. They might have a pension. And so they are um, able to like, you know, when these people get to hear about what's going on with like the the checks they're collecting every month, their ears are wide open, you know? And so when right. they get to hear on Fox News, them talking about uh, WRS investing into Bitcoin, then they're like, they may, they probably won't, but they may be like, oh, what is Bitcoin? What is crypto? And just bringing that narrative, which is kind of what I got from Brad's whole spiel here. It was Brad was talking about narrative, talking about it, mass, you know, mass crypto adoption of of mouth, you know, <laughs> like right. the, the way of talking about crypto on a bigger scale is important, right? But um, it's not everything. And this is maybe somewhere down the line, this me, me, me and Brad disagree here. Well, before that, he said the wheels of legislative process, progress move slowly and carefully, which Correct. is Maddie. I know some you've echoed a lot. And, you know, it definitely is, is very slow. Um, and, and it sometimes can, can be good, but many times like the situation we're in right now with crypto in america it's moving too slow then we see like hong kong just like you said last year hong kong 
uh, jump starting, and now they're like passing us in a sense when it comes to spy Ethereum ETF, looking past you know what America has looked past. And I was describing uh, this to someone this weekend. It's like America has like you know some politicians or some people in Congress might have a vision for crypto, but there's always like a next level to it. You know, like Michael Saylor's idea of Bitcoin is it's going to be the best asset of all time. Um, it's going to be lucrative for micro strategy, and it's going to save us all. When someone like me looks at it, it's like, oh, Bitcoin's just an investment. I don't see it saving the earth. I don't uh, saving the earth becoming legal tender. I don't view it in that nature, you know. And so we have different ideas of Bitcoin, of crypto, and so does the government, and so does the government see it in relation to how it's going to affect America. Even though they might look at it right now, it's like, oh, crypto's fun money, you know. So right. on top of that, though, Maddie. Brad says something about he's seeing a softening of rhetoric. And when I hear that, that sounds like we're, you know, talk about Jerome Powell and the Fed, you know, when they talk about monetary policy, which is cool because market reaction happens when Jerome Powell gives his press conference. Right. But when talking about softening of rhetoric, Mattery, when it comes to uh, crypto topics coming out of especially, especially the Biden administration, that means nothing for me, right, Maddie? That means absolutely right. nothing. You can soften your rhetoric all you want about crypto. That is not helping people, your regular retail, my grandparents or my parents want to get in crypto. Once these people start talking, we talked about this before, Matty, you're a libertarian and we know um, people are like sheep. They listen to these people at the right. top and they follow them. I guarantee you after Trump started talking about crypto and Bitcoin, that opens a lot of minds to the idea of crypto and Bitcoin because he was so bearish. He was, you know, I like uh, there was this um, Vivek Ramaswamy brought up this idea months ago about like Dick Cheney Republicanism. And that is kind of where it comes to like with the dollar is like the dollar is America's currency. It's American. And now right. we see Trump being like, hey, Bitcoin, crypto, let's go. Screw Elizabeth Warren. You know, it's just yeah. like funny how we got here. So, Maddie, any any talking points on this? I know you always have a lot to talk about, but anything in relation to this? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that people do you know, romanticize the dollar a bit. And like you've said, you know, they, they put it on a pedestal that, you know, well, if we move away from the dollar, you know, where we, where do we go from here? Might as well be in Vietnam, you know, like, and it's, it's such a big leap, you know, like, um, you know, like we, we don't have to, to romanticize any piece of currency, right? Like the, the only reason we have any sort of like stable-ish paper money, right? Or like, you know, tender that's not barters because barter is not practical for everyday purposes, right? Like I, if I bake rhubarb pies for a living and, you know, you, you know, sell lumber for a living, you, you can only need so many rhubarb pies and I need a lot more lumber than that, right? It doesn't make sense. So, you know, it, it, to me, I don't have any actual attachment to the dollar. If we want to use Fed coin, we want to use USA coin, I really do not care. It doesn't bother me um, as long as we have, you know, uh, some sort of like finite amount of, of that actual currency. That's where things actually start to, to make a difference here. Otherwise, you know, if we're just going to always be pegged to the dollar and we're not moving into some other sort of like, you know, fixed currency, the same depreciation is always going to happen because they can just print more money and that will in turn affect the stable coin value and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just kind of like an invisible devaluation that we have with the dollar right now, right? Like even though your dollar always says one, your purchasing power goes up and down. You just don't see that minus or plus as it's happening. Whereas crypto, we're just a lot more aware of like, you know, are we actually pegged? Is there a depegging? Like, is there, you know, more in circulation than should be right now? Or, you know, are things, you know, exponentially more expensive compared to what they usually are? We're just less aware of that with the dollars until we actually go to start to pay for things. Um, whereas within crypto, we kind of see that a little bit more granularly. So, you know, is there always going to be a generation that thinks that, you know, uh, we're we're doing something stupid here and we're making irrational decisions by moving to a digital only? Yeah, definitely. But to me, it, it makes a lot more sense. It makes accounting a lot more simple, um, reduces theft, uh, at least in relations to, you know, stealing physical money, right? Like it's think about how much money is put into the into our economy on a regular basis, just picking up, securing cash, you know, those guarded trucks like it's a very, very lucrative business um, and people put them, their lives in danger to to move, you know, physical cash. And it's very impractical, especially with a system that has, you know, um, transparency, you know, accountability, really, really good uh, accounting, you know, uh, software. That's basically what a lot of blockchain is, is it's just advanced accounting software. So, you know, the, the transition is not going to be smooth, but once we do get there, it's going to make business a lot easier. Maddie, at Consensus this weekend, Brad Garlinghouse went into updates 
regarding the SEC v. Ripple case. And I have some notes jotted down here, for, um, you know, of what he talked about. But I want to hear from your perspective here because you are that guy. When, it, when, when someone brings up SEC v. Ripple, they have to talk about Matthew Breeding because Matthew was breaking <laughs> it down every single week on the Crypto Charge Live show on the website. So I just want to give you that opportunity. Any updates regarding SEC v. Ripple? Yeah, so you know we're just kind of in the tail end of it here. Um, you know, like we've talked about, the the big piece for us retail investors was the designation of XRP as a non-security. That's really at the end of the day all we care about. Now, could we maybe see a, a small blow on XRP price if uh, you know there was some sort of large disgorgement that Ripple has to pay? Potentially, just because retail investors are kind of stupid and they're very emotional. Um, but for the most part, all we're waiting on here is just kind of like the little loose ends. Do they actually owe anything? Um, of course, you can go round and round in appeals. And that, that's one thing I've talked about previously, you know, with, with, the, with the courts is if you have the time and the money, you can go round and round with the courts and the appellate courts for, for quite some time until you actually get to a, a resolution. Um, so, you know, this might not even be wrapped up completely in a year. Do they most likely want to, you know, get things wrapped up sooner than that? Maybe take a settlement. And even if they don't think that they Anything wrong if it's a low enough number yeah just so they don't have to waste any more time or money in court um but you know this could take several more years potentially if the appeals go on long enough yes and brad garlinghouse talked about the institutional sales is something called an investment contract if you've been around you know exactly what this is and that could be a security and so those were deemed unregistered securities so Brad discussed that and also when we could see potentially a uh, finalization of this. He called it a, he said, it's a final half mile of the marathon. So this last part <laughs> where we're getting into it here. Which and, is always the toughest part, by the way. <laughs> right, right. And we saw, I think it was like last December, November, we saw like, oh, Ripple's got to pay $2 billion in legal fees. And Brad discussed, it's likely going to be millions and not $2 billion. That's just asinine. Right. And maybe a resolution this summer. Talking about the stablecoin here, the stablecoin market is very interesting and a booming market. Stablecoin market, he said, was around 150 to 200 billion today. I had to fact check him. It's around 160 billion. So he's right, a little bit on the lower end, but he foresees it somewhere in the $2 trillion market cap this run and you know likely to see shifts in market share. And this is where Ripple is trying to attack with the Ripple stablecoin. Will they be successful? I hope so. I hope there's some value of this. I hope I can earn some APY off this, potentially on like Coinbase or whatever platform I'm going to be using at the time. Maddie, some in relation that we haven't talked about in Relial is Ripple going public. And Brad G, uh, when asked about this, he was very hesitant. He like stuttered. And right when he hesitated, I'm like, Brad G is hesitant, you know, which <laughs> is like, like a journalist or reporter. And he says he is not popular with Gary Gensler in the SEC, obviously. And he says going public in the US right now doesn't make any sense and is doesn't sound very interesting to him maddie what would it mean for ripple to go public and how could this affect us well i i would love to have exposure to ripple i technically have a small pre-exposure through link to because they've you know reduced the requirements but it's it's not a significant amount i when ripple does go public i absolutely plan on investing and building a position in ripple um you know i'm not super heavy into the stock market as you know crypto is a lot more lucrative but you know if i'm going to be picky and i'm going to add some long-term exposure you know Ripple's a, a no-brainer for me. You know, even if we see different developments, uh, you know, even additional assets or, or helper tools added to the XRP e XRPL ecosystem, um, that doesn't change the long-term trajectory of Ripple. It's the equivalent of buying like Visa, right? Like it's the equivalent of owning the underlying tech that Visa is using, and then also owning shares of, of Visa. So you're kind of like on on playing both sides of it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's that's part of my long-term plan now. I, I, some of the commentary is probably like, all right, we've already had like this horrible long experience with the SEC here. We know Gary is a very unreasonable person and in a lot of politicians' pockets right now and making egregious amounts of money for the suppression and, and lawsuit and everything that's been going on. I would imagine that they would wait for a changing of the guard before applying for uh, the, the right to go public w with Ripple, right? It would, it's just most likely going to be denial, denial, denial if they do this with Gary, especially after a fat L and taking multiple L's in this case. Um, you know, even the pride alone uh, is probably going to keep them from, you know, uh, allowing them to go public. And, you know, like we talked about, yeah, you might get what you want in the end, but it's going to cost you a lot of time and money. So might as well just keep bolstering up, especially, you know, let, let them recover a little bit after being in this for like literally early years, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I, I think that would probably be a, a better catalyst for them. So, you know, 
does Gary Gensler somehow uh, become replaced in the next year or two? I think it's very possible. I don't think that people are very happy with him. I think that there's been a lot of uh, uh, overt statements from Congress and, and calls to action about, hey, you're killing this industry, you're disrupting it, what's happening here, you're abusing your power. So it's not like this conversation is just with retail anymore. There is this conversation on the congressional side, but we've got to see that follow through, right? It's just like when we saw this bill come up and everyone's really pumped and we're like, yeah, we have you know majority on this, right? Like it makes sense, this is bipartisan, let's go, we're cooking and Biden's like, eh, sorry guys, I really hate America and all of you guys, um, so we're not doing this. Uh, so I like try, I'm, I'm enthusiastic, but I try not to let it, you know, build up too much because it's it, all it takes is one one little person to to knock it on its head. So, you know, I think that will go public. I'm excited for when they do go public. I'll build a position when they do. Um, and who knows? It's part of the statement here could imply that maybe Ripple goes partially public or a public in another country, right? Um, you could have you could have a listing elsewhere and then, you know, eventually go go public here on the U.S. stock market. So, you know, we'll see what it means. I, I think he's being cryptic on purpose. And you also, you know, can't give away too much information because you do have other shareholders and you have other people's interests that you have to protect, especially when you're not a public company. So lots to consider, but long term excited and I'm ready for Ripple to be public. Maddie, last thing I want to talk about in relation to what Brad Garlinghouse uh, discussed at Consensus this weekend is he talked about crypto being inevitable. He said even through all the problems we've been through, crypto is still here. So like, he's referencing the fraud and manipulation we've seen in this market. Um, so Maddie, my question to you is: Is crypto inevitable? Absolutely. Um, and to your to your comment about fraud and you know people who, who they say it because you know they, you have people who uh create faulty projects or you know steal from one another or you know create look-alike websites where people lose a lot of money people have been defrauding each other for thousands and thousands of years well before technology was ever a thing right um you're always going to have that battle between you know keeping consumers safe and keeping investors safe and um also pushing new bounds of technology that we don't have regulation for and this is not the last time by the way guys that we'll have this conversation about not just us but you know as a country in relations to congress in relations to, to laws uh, relating to these kinds of things as the technology continues to evolve because we won't have the same crypto sphere that we have today in 10 years it will be exponentially more complex you know, more interesting, more powerful in 10 years from now, and you're going to need new regulation that comes in with that. And there's going to be people over that period as the tech evolves again, after we just get comfortable, you know, making this more safe, making it more accessible, um, that people will start to exploit the new loopholes and you have to have new regulation that comes in. Unfortunately, though, right, you're always going to have the the people who want to manipulate just a step or two ahead of that, you know, congressional, uh, you know, definition and approval and, and you know, um, creating a safer space. So I think that Brad's very aware of all of that. I think that he's probably one of the most level-headed people in this space he doesn't you know um start crying or screaming or yelling just because you know he's upset with the way things are going he understands how the legal system works he understands how uh you know our our, our process works when it comes to lawmaking and it's slow it's unfortunately very slow um so you know it is inevitable in the sense of the tech's not going anywhere um, pandora's out of the box you can't put it back in uh, but it's going to take some time for us to actually see full integration uh into society Absolutely, Maddie. And at this point, this is where you want to invest. You know, we are still, here we go again. We are still so early. You hear that so often. We are still so early. And I truly believe that. And with the opportunities that are out there right now, I mean, we'll probably go into depth on the Ask Maddie show. If you want to go in depth, Maddie will probably definitely go in depth, way in depth on the Crypto Charge <laughs> live show uh, throughout the week. So, team, if you want that breakdown, you know, join the platform, pin link down below. But like we are so early that there are still so many lucrative altcoins out there. And you should not be pass passing this up right now. I put a tweet out this morning. I'm like, listen, like you should be DCAing, throwing limit orders down, setting limit orders, or both right now. Like there's just right. no way you should not be doing that right now. Because if you're not, you're behind. If you don't have a game plan, you're behind. If you don't know how you're gonna sell, you're behind. In my opinion, if you don't have alerts set up on TradingView, you're behind, you know? And so all accumulation of all these things is what you need to do to be ready for the bull run. And you can only get that at Crypto Charge. Your YouTuber is not going to tell you that. YouTube is not going to tell you all this. He won't talk about his exit strategy. He's not going to talk about what he's going to do post-crypto profits. We only do that at Crypto Charge, so make sure you join us there. Team, we will see you 2.30 p.m. Pacific for the Ask Maddie Show. So leave your questions down below if you have any questions, anything for Maddie here, leave them down below. And make sure you like this video, and we will see you guys Wednesday. Bye.